In this last module on bores, I will finish up the caterpillars that bore into plants, then discuss some of the sawflies and midges that are known to bore into plants. There is also a small group of flies and moths that bore into the outer phloem of small branches. These are generally known as cambium miners. The carpenter worm is likely the largest larva that can be found boring into hardwoods, even larger than the Asian longhorn beetle larva. The adult moths are also very large and one has to wonder how the female can fly with its wide body and heavy abdomen. The females have a wingspan of four to five inches and they are generally mottled with gray patches that generally helps camouflage them when they are resting on tree bark. This pest is a native of North America and can be found from the east to the west coast. Over most of its range, the larvae take two to four years to mature as they are feeding in the nutrient-poor xylem of deciduous tree branches and trunks. In the eastern states, older oaks seem to be preferred, but in the Rocky Mountains, poplars are preferred, and in California, live oaks are common hosts. However, this pest has been found attacking a dozen other deciduous tree species. The moths often emerge in May and emergence can continue into July. The adult female can live for a month and during that time she can lay 300 to 600 eggs. To the untrained eye, attacked trees often have large gouty growths with raised bark. Sometimes there is some sap flow and in many cases the large pupil cases are the first symptom that a bore is present. The robust larvae are definitely caterpillars as they have five pairs of prominent prolegs with crochets. The larvae are usually a light gray-green color but they can occasionally be pinkish. The head capsule is brown and there are only a few dorsal sclerotized patches on the anterior segments. The rest of the body is devoid of spots or stripes. Females attach large sticky eggs in small masses under flaps of bark and often where there is some bark damage or sap flow. Upon hatching the larvae appear bristly with stout hairs and they are usually a dark pink color. The larvae first burrow into the sapwood and feed in the zone for several months. This burrowing can cause gouty growth and sap flow. Eventually the larvae burrow deep into the xylem, often following the direction of the fibers. At all times the larvae maintain an opening to the outside where frass is periodically expelled. The larvae pupate near the access hole and the pupil case is pushed out of the hole for the moth to emerge. Since this bore is often located deep in the xylem, there is no way that insecticides can reach the feeding larvae. However, injection of insect parasitic nematodes into the burrow has proven to be an effective treatment. The leopard moth is a relative of the carpenter worm, but the leopard moth is an invasive species that attacks trees and shrubs in Europe and North Africa. It was first found in New Jersey in 1887 and it is now found from New England states to South Dakota. Unfortunately, there is another native giant black woolly bear caterpillar that turns into a giant leopard moth. Both moths have robust bodies and the wings are snowy white with black spots. The true leopard moth adult has spots that are made of solid blue-black scales while the giant leopard moth adult spots are actually circles. Leopard moth caterpillars are distinctly spotted and the larvae are known to attack a wide range of deciduous shade tree species. Adults can emerge from May to September and females can attach up to 800 eggs onto the bark of potential hosts. The larvae prefer to burrow through thin bark so they are often located in branches that are one to three inches in diameter. The larvae burrow into the xylem and normally take two years to complete their development. Feeding in small branches can kill the branch and the larva is known to emerge and burrow into another branch if this occurs. The larva pushes out frass from its entrance hole and this is often the way that they are detected. 
Fortunately, this pest rarely occurs in large numbers on any one plant, so its activity results in a few branches dying. The iris borer is a very common pest of iris, especially bearded iris. However, other rhizomatous iris species will be attacked, including some of the Japanese and Siberian irises. Technically, we could consider this a root pest as it does most of its damage to the rhizomes. The moth emerges in late fall, usually in October. It is a large, dark gray moth that looks like a large cutworm. After mating, the females attach eggs to the bases of iris leaves. The eggs overwinter and hatch when the iris begin spring growth and start to push their flower stalks up through the leaves. The larvae crawl to the leaf tips and begin mining downward in the leaf folds. This will appear as brown streaks where the leaves fold together. For the next month, the larva will slowly burrow down the fleshy middle of the leaves until they reach the rhizome at the leaf base. Here the larvae will continue feeding in the rhizomes. They usually don't damage the flower stalks and the iris plants will appear to bloom as normal. However, usually in late July through August, the leaves will suddenly wilt and collapse. Pushing on the rhizomes that are exposed on the surface of the soil will usually reveal that they are nothing but a thin husk. The large plump larvae burrow into the soil when they have finished feeding to form a pupa. Cultural control involves popping the larvae as they burrow down the leaves. Simply squeeze the leaves with brown streaks in mid-bay until the larva is detected as a bulge. Then squeeze harder until they are squashed. Some commercial iris growers lift their iris plants in July and remove and squash any larvae that are found. Systemic insecticides can also be effective when applied as the larvae burrow down the leaves. The European corn borer is one of the most important corn pests found across North America. This invasive pest was introduced in the 1920s. It generally overwinters as pupae in old corn stalks and the first adults are usually seen in late May through June. In spite of its name, this pest attacks a wide range of agricultural crops including pepper, soybean, and cotton. Its larvae will burrow into many weeds and the stems of perennial flowers. I have found it in several composite flower stems, including dahlias. Females generally attach patches of flat eggs to potential host leaves. Upon hatching, the larvae burrow into the stems of pithy plants. The larvae are usually creamy white but can be pinkish in color. They are distinctively covered with rows of darker sclerotized spots, which is found on most pyralid larvae. There are usually two to three generations per season with the larvae of the last generation pupating in plant stalks. In field crops, grinding of stock residues or plowing in stalks is the normal method of reducing populations. In perennial flower beds, old flower stalks should be cut at the ground level and ground up, buried, or removed from the area. Normally, they are more of a curiosity in flower beds as they rarely have extensive infestations. The common stock borer, or simply stock borer, is only one species of many in the genus Papampima. The genus has nearly 50 species in North America and all have larvae that burrow into stems of plants. The stock borer seems to prefer giant ragweed and jopai weed and can be a major pest in cornfields that have these weeds. It has been recovered from more than 170 species of plants, including herbaceous plants and woody trees and shrubs. The life cycle is quite different than most of the borers we have discussed. The adults emerge and fly from mid-August through mid-October. Mated females scatter eggs into the dead leaves and stems of plants. These eggs overwinter and hatch the following spring. The larvae burrow into the stems of potential host plants and feed inside the stems. 
If the stem dies or the larva becomes too big to fit inside the stem, it will emerge and seek another stem in which to burrow. The larvae have a distinctive black band around the middle of the body and white stripes anterior and posterior to this band. The larvae usually take two to three months to mature. At this time they will drop to the ground or occasionally they will pupate in the last stem that they have bored out. Other species in this genus have similar life cycles and some specialize on feeding on asters, coneflowers, and other composite flower species. Extensive damage is rare, but thorough cleaning and removing of dead plant residues in the fall helps keep populations to a minimum in urban landscapes. The maple petiole borer is a sawfly that has larvae that burrow into the petioles of sugar maple. It can occasionally attack other maple species. This is an introduced pest from Europe. The small sawflies emerge in early to mid-May and insert eggs into the bases of maple petioles. Upon hatching, the larva burrows in the petiole where they devour most of the tissues. The burrowed out petioles soon collapse, usually near the leaf base, and the leaves droop. Upon being twisted in the wind, the leaves break away from the petioles and can litter the ground. The larva finishes its development within the petiole stub on the tree, then drops to the ground to pupate until the next spring. Therefore, raking up and disposing of dropped leaves has no influence on the populations of this pest. Noticeable leaf drop from this pest is sporadic and the loss of leaves seems to have a minimal impact on tree health. The curled roast slug sawfly was actually covered back when we discussed foliage eating pests. The larva first skeletonizes then eats entire leaves. We are covering it again here because the larvae pupate by burrowing into the pithy stems of the rose plant and spinning a loose cocoon. When the larvae burrow down green canes, they can sever the vascular tissues that are supplying the buds arising from the cane. This can cause those buds to die, which is really annoying to rose growers who prune their plants in a manner to force certain buds to break and send flower shoots in a particular direction. When these buds don't break, the next one down the chute will break and it may be facing in a direction that the rose grower didn't want. The curled rose slug has two generations with adults flying in May and again in July. The second generation larvae overwinter as a prepupa in the stem. One of these prepupa is shown in the lower image. Rose slugs are best controlled by using a sawfly active insecticide while the larvae are still feeding on the rose leaves. My last sawfly borer is the pigeon tree mix or horntail. These sawflies are about one and a half inches long. They are occasionally found on the trunks of trees that have recently died or are in the process of dying. I also see them on poorly pruned tree branches where there is a long stub remaining. The larvae burrow into the heartwood and take a year to develop. So technically the larvae do not attack healthy trees, but when they are found they may be blamed for the death of the tree. Notice that the larvae have very short legs but no prolegs and the tip of the abdomen ends in a sharp diagnostic spine. The tip of the abdomen of the adult also ends in a spine which is where the common name horntail comes from. I often get inquiries about large parasitic ichneumonid wasps that attack the horntail larvae. These are all in the genus Megarissa and the females can have five inch long ovipositors that are used to push into the wood, locate the horntail larva and insert an egg into its body. That's quite a feat of remote sensing and location. There are actually two midges that have larvae that burrow in the shoots of junipers. The juniper midge and the juniper tip midge. Both are in the family Cecidomyidae, which is generally called gall midges, but these midges don't make unusual plant growths or galls. The juniper midge tends to feed on juniper shoots 
an inch or more from the tip of the chute. The juniper tip midge larvae burrow in the very tips of junipers. Both can cause the small branches to turn brown, which can look like fungal tip blights. The juniper midge usually makes a small round emergence hole, but the juniper tip midge generally emerges by squeezing through some leaf scales. The midges are very small, less than a quarter inch long, and are orange in color. The larvae of both species are also yellow-orange in color. Even if the adults have emerged, damaged shoots should have some small frass pellets contained in the burrows. Both midges seem to have one generation per season with nearly mature larvae overwintering. About a dozen species of pine pitch midges occur in North America, with three of them being apparently introductions. These are also called resin midges. All have larvae that rasp their way through the thin bark of pine shoots, usually at the bases of buds or recently expanded shoots, and this causes pits to flow. The maggots are generally bright orange to yellow in color and feed under the cover of the pitch nodules that form as a result of their severing of the phloem tissues. For most of the species, the adult midges emerge over a 7 to 10 day period in late May into early June. After mating, females deposit eggs at the bases of needles or in fissures of twig bark. Upon hatching, the larvae rasp through the thin bark into the phloem, which causes clear pits to begin oozing out. The larvae feed for the rest of the summer, remain dormant during the winter, then finish development and pupate in early May. In landscapes, these pitch midges are usually missed and the occasionally flagged branch is assumed to have been killed by disease. In Christmas tree plantations, they can build up sufficient populations that controls may be needed. Rose midge damage is often misdiagnosed as disease or other maladies. The larvae burrow themselves deeply into the crevices at the bases of new leaf shoots and flower buds. The larvae rasp and feed on the epidermal tissues. This can cause a distinctive curling of the growing shoots. Extensive feeding will could eventually girdle the shoots and budge, which causes them to wilt, droop, and fall off. This is often mistaken for botrytis fungal blight. Hybrid tea roses are extremely susceptible. The rose midge appears to be an imported species that was first detected and described in 1884 when it was attacking greenhouse roses in New Jersey. It continued to be a major greenhouse pest until the 1920s when USDA researchers developed effective controls that required fumigation. This pest is another midge in the family of midges, the Cessidobiidae, that cause plant galls or leaf miners or cause other types of plant damage. With the dramatic increase of using roses in landscapes due to the development of cultivars that are resistant to fungal diseases, the rose midge and rose slugs have become increasingly important problems. I'm using this old USDA illustration because it nicely shows the stages of this tiny insect. The eggs are tucked into leaf folds of new shoot and flower buds. The maggots rasp the surface of the shoots and often sever the phloem vascular bundles. This causes the developing shoot or bud to flag. Mature larvae drop to the ground and spin a cocoon. The pupa is formed in the cocoon. The tiny midges have smoky gray wings and yellowish bodies. This pest can complete several generations during the summer months and this can result in virtually all new buds being destroyed by midsummer. This pest overwinters as dormant pupae. The new adults can emerge quite early in the spring, usually when the first flush of flower buds begin to form. During cool weather, the life cycle often takes about a month to complete. But in warm weather and in greenhouses, the life cycle can be completed in only two weeks. The adults only live for a day or two. 
They don't feed and their only goal is to mate and deposit eggs. Here's a slide that I use when I give talks to Rosarians. I wanted to show you how difficult it can be to manage this pest. There have been several studies where cultural and chemical controls have been tested. As you might guess, if the larvae drop from the plants to pupate in the soil, there have been several attempts to interfere with this behavior by placing something to intercept the larvae. Indeed, when plastic is placed around the bases of the roses and extended some way out, this can keep the larvae from finding pupation sites. But plastic covers often cause root diseases with roses and the exposed plastic isn't a really good look in urban landscapes. Others have recommended pinching out all buds that show symptoms, but this generally results in the roses not blooming. In short, the pinching out is as bad as the insect damage. Insecticides are the only effective treatments and there are two approaches. Use a systemic to kill new larvae or create an insecticide barrier on the mulch and soil surface to kill pupating larvae. The problem is, is that many of the neonicotinoids cannot be used in blooming plants or they have restrictions on the number of times that they can be applied in a season. Currently, I recommend applying one of the neonicotinoids as a soil drench when about an inch of new shoots are showing. This takes out the first generation, which is the key to season-long success. Camium miners are generally considered to be agromycid fly larvae in the genus Phytobia. But there is some evidence that a couple of micro moths may also have larvae that cause the same damage. Apparently the larvae of the flies create elongate, sometimes sinuate mines in the cambium and phloem zones of smaller tree branches. As the cambium is repaired, the mine may result in a tiny raised area. In other trees, the mine can simply appear as a discolored trail in the bark. Very little is known about these bores, but their activity can apparently cause dark flecks to form in the wood of trees over time. When these trees are cut for veneer, the dark spots are considered to be a downgrade. In landscape trees, they are minor aesthetic pests that don't require any further attention.